The streets were still empty. Levin went to the house of the Shcherbatskys. The visitors' doors were closed and everything was asleep. He walked back, went into his room again, and asked for coffee. The day servant, not Yegor this time, brought it to him. Levin would have entered into conversation with him, but a bell rang for the servant and he went out. Levin tried to drink coffee and put some roll in his mouth, but his mouth was quite at a loss with what to do with the roll. Levin, rejecting the roll, put on his coat and went out again for a walk. It was nine o'clock when he reached the Shcherbatskys' steps the second time. In the house they were only just up, and the cook came out to go marketing. He had to go through at least two hours more. All that night and morning Levin lived perfectly unconsciously, and felt perfectly lifted out of the conditions of material life. He had eaten nothing for a whole day. He had not slept for two nights. He had spent several hours undressed in the frozen air, and felt not simply fresher and stronger than ever, but felt utterly independent of his body. He moved without muscular effort, and felt as if he could do anything. He was convinced he could fly upwards, or lift the corner of the house if need be. He spent the remainder of the time in the street, incessantly looking at his watch and gazing about him. And what he saw then, he never saw again after. The children especially going to school, the bluish doves flying down from the roofs to the pavement, and the little loaves covered with flour, thrust out by an unseen hand, touched him. Those loaves, those doves, and those two boys were not earthly creatures. It all happened at the same time. A boy ran towards a dove and glanced, smiling at Levin. The dove, with a whirr of her wings, darted away, flashing in the sun, amid grains of snow that quivered in the air, while from a little window there came a smell of freshly baked bread, and the loaves were put out. All of this together was so extraordinarily nice that Levin laughed and cried with delight. Going a long way round to Gazetsny Place and Kislovka, he went back again to the hotel, and putting his watch before him, he sat down to wait for twelve o'clock. In the next room they were talking about some sort of machines, and swindling, and coughing their morning coughs. They did not realize that the hand was near twelve. The hand reached it. Levin went out onto the steps. The sledge drivers clearly knew all about it. They crowded round Levin with happy faces, quarreling among themselves and offering their services, trying not to offend the other sledge drivers, and promising to drive with them too. Levin took one and told him to drive to the Shcherbatskys. The sledge driver was splendid in a white shirt collar sticking out over his overcoat and into his strong, full-bodied red neck. The sledge was high and comfortable and altogether such a one as Levin had never drove in after, and the horse was a good one, and tried to gallop, but didn't seem to move. The driver knew the Sherbatsky's house, and drew up at the entrance with a curve of his arm and a hole, especially indicative of respect for his fare. The Sherbatsky's hall-porter certainly knew all about it. This was evident from the smile in his eyes, and the way he said, "'Well, it's a long time since you've been to see us, Konstantin Dmitrievich. Not only he knew all about it, but he was unmistakably delighted and making efforts to conceal his joy. Looking into his kindly old eyes, Levin realized even something new in his happiness. Are they up? Pray walk in. Leave it here, said he, smiling as Levin would have come back to take his hat. That meant something. "'To whom shall I announce your honour? asked the footman. The footman, though a young man, and one of the new school of footmen, a dandy, was a very kind-hearted, good fellow, and he, too, knew all about it. "'The princess, the prince, the young princess,' said Levin. The first person he saw was Mademoiselle Leon. She walked across the room, and her ringlets in her face were beaming. He had only just spoken to her, when suddenly he heard the rustle of a skirt at the door, and Mademoiselle Leon vanished from Levin's eyes, 
and a joyful terror came over him at the nervousness of his happiness. Mademoiselle Leon was in great haste, and leaving him, went out at the other door. Directly she had gone out, swift, swift light steps sounded on the parquet, and his bliss, his life, himself, what was best in himself, what he had so long sought and longed for, was quickly, so quickly approaching him. She did not walk, but seemed, by some unseen force, to float to him. He saw nothing but her clear, truthful eyes, frightened by the same bliss of love that flooded his heart. Those eyes were shining nearer and nearer, blinding him with their light of love. She stopped still close to him, touching him. Her hands rose and dropped onto his shoulders. She had done all she could. She had run up to him and given herself up entirely, shy and happy. He put his arms round her and pressed his lips to her mouth that sought his kiss. She, too, had not slept all night, and had been expecting him all the morning. Her father and mother had consented without demur, and were happy in her happiness. She had been waiting for him. She wanted to be the first to tell him her happiness and his. She had got ready to see him alone, and had been delighted at the idea, and had been shy and ashamed, and did not know herself what she was doing. She had heard his steps and voice, and had waited at the door for Mademoiselle Leon to go. Mademoiselle Leon had gone away, without thinking, without asking herself how and what, she had gone up to him, and did as she was doing. "'Let us go to Mama," she said, taking him by the hand. For a long while he could say nothing, not so much because he was afraid of desecrating the loftiness of his emotion by a word, as that every time he tried to say something, instead of words he felt that tears of happiness were welling up. He took her hand and kissed it. "'Can it be true?' he said at last in a choked voice. "'I can't believe you love me, dear.' She smiled at that dear, and at the timidity with which he gazed at her. Yes, she said significantly, deliberately, I am so happy. Now letting go his hands, she went into the drawing-room. The princess, seeing them, breathed quickly, and immediately began to cry, and then immediately began to laugh, and with a vigorous step Levin had not expected, ran up to him, and hugging his head, kissed him, wetting his cheeks with her tears. So it is all settled. I am glad. Love her. I am glad. Kitty. You have not been long settling things, said the old prince, trying to seem unmoved, but Levin noticed that his eyes were wet when he turned to him. I've long, always wished for this, said the prince, taking Levin by the arm and drawing him towards himself. Even when this little featherhead fancied, Papa, shrieked Kitty, and shut his mouth with her hands. Well, I won't, he said. I'm very, very, ple. Oh, what a fool I am. He embraced Kitty, kissed her face, her hand, her face again, and made the sign of the cross over her. And there came over Levin a new feeling of love for this man, till then so little known to him, when he saw how slowly and tenderly Kitty kissed his muscular hand. End of chapter 15